The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies. Today we're talking to Dr. Jim Lehane about the geology and paleontology about everyone's favorite desert planet, Tatooine. Star Wars Ologies is a podcast for Star Wars fans looking to connect real world science, technology, and fields of study to the galaxy far, far away. From biology, geology, and cosmology to linguistics, psychology, and even brewing, we examine Star Wars with the insight of our guest experts. If you've ever wondered how Tauntauns survive on Hoth, or how ion engines work, or what drives the Sith, this is the podcast for you. We'll be talking to ecologists about the swamps of Dagobah, engineers about building machines to work on alien worlds, and artisan cheesemakers about what you can do with blue milk. Who are we? I'm Melissa Miller. And I'm James Floyd, and we're both freelance writers for Star Wars Insider Magazine. Melissa is also an oceanographic researcher and science writer. She's written about the natural history of boards and space lugs. And James has written about his travels to Star Wars filming locations like Ireland and Death Valley. He also writes for StarWars.com and has a background in transportation planning. We are both big nerds for all things academic and all things Star Wars. Got an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies or know an expert in their field? Let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or at Star Wars Ologies, Star Wars O-L-O-G-I-E-S at gmail.com. No topic is off limits, even the taxation of trade routes and outlying systems. All right, Melissa, punch it. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies. This episode, Star Wars Ologies is going to chat about geology and paleontology on Tatooine with our guest expert, Dr. Jim Lehane. Yeah, Master, Tatooine. It's small, out of the way, poor. The Trade Federation have no presence there. I'll meet you at the rendezvous point on Tatooine. Tatooine it is then. Tatooine it is then. To learn more about Tatooine, we have our guest, Dr. Jim Lehane. Hey, Jim, how did you get into your field? A lot of kids really like dinosaurs when they're kids. Uh, and I was one of those five-year-olds that decided that they like dinosaurs and kind of wanted to be a paleontologist, although at the time I thought it was archaeology. And that's a different thing, I'm told, um, as Indiana Jones will let us know. Uh, archaeology is not paleontology. But uh, I've always wanted to be it, do it. And so eventually um, I figured out the best way to get into paleontology was to study geology. And my learnings uh, took me through uh, undergrad in geology. And then I got a master's in geology specializing in uh, vertebrate paleontology. And then for my PhD, I studied these things called trace fossils for, for um as, which is part of paleontology. Trace fossils are basically like fossils, but not fossils. So where fossils, you have bones and stuff there. Trace fossils are the remains of that the animals left behind. You think of worm burrows or footprints and that sort of thing. Those are trace fossils where you don't actually have the animal left behind. But I also studied geology to get there as well. And so I kind of, um, depending on who I'm talking to, I'll kind of bounce back and forth because I am a, definitely a hardcore geologist, but I also am a paleontologist and I love paleontology and geology both. Did Star Wars influence your career choice at all? Probably not. Um, kind of, uh, I would say more of the Jurassic Park syndrome uh, kind of got me into it, but I was already deep into dinosaurs by that point that Jurassic Park came out. Jurassic Park's one of those that you'll hear a lot of paleontologists say, like, that's what got me into paleontology. And I was kind of already there. Although Star Wars didn't get me into geology, Star Wars uh, geology is really kind of I, what I pick out of things. And I've been always huge about geological references in pop culture and geological references and paleontology references that I see anywhere. Um, I will pull out random things in books that I read and kind of dive deep into them regardless of what they are it could be the iliad for all i know and if i see a geology reference I'll, I'll dive into it and kind of figure out where it came from and what it means and how does it relate to the homer who wrote it not that i actually know any geology references in the iliad so it's probably not the best one but uh you get my point 
Well, what are some geology references in Star Wars? I know we're mostly going to talk about Tatooine just because we're trying to keep a a narrow focus, but um, just a quick one in terms of what you notice when you're watching Star Wars and pull out and think about. Okay. So one quick one about not Tatooine. Um, When I was sitting in the movie theater, it was went to the midnight showing of The Last Jedi and they are on a planet called Crate. And if you notice, I think it was Ryan Johnson's character who actually kind of licks the, the it puts his finger on the ground and goes, hmm, salt. Oh, you mean Gareth Edwards, the director of Rogue One? Oh, what a cool cameo. But if you notice, the entire planet is bright red. There's actually a type of salt that is bright red. Really? And it, I, kind of, I kind of like um, nerdgasmed at that because it's it's not a it's not a thing that most people know salt is a mineral um a mineral known as halite nacl which is salt but there is a variety called sylvite which is kcl potassium chloride Mm -hmm. it doesn't taste exactly like halite it doesn't taste like like that salt that you would say is salty taste it's kind of a bitter salt but it's still a salt. It, 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 they're basically um, like mineral uh, siblings to each other. And so that's, I kind of, um, I, I write for a website called uh, AIPT Comics and I kind of uh, nerded out about that the next morning because it's one of those things I was like so excited. I'm like, they, they, like, they may not have done this on purpose, but to me, it, it was awesome. Yeah. Well, and The Last Jedi is really what got me to get nerdy professionally uh, about Star Wars too. But I was thinking also one of the crossovers between your and my fields is that they show a fossil um, or at least a skeleton, right? A buried yes. skeleton on the Acto. Very, the very quick zoom by. I still haven't been, yeah. like gone back and froze that, but you're right. That, that has uh, the very quick uh, fossil skeleton under the ground. Yeah. yeah, I actually have paused it and gone back and looked. It's looks to me like some sort of four-legged mammal and it's in the scene where luke is telling ray all about the force and how everything's connected and it's just this quick they show the plants growing and then underneath the plants there's a skeleton oh wow i forgot about that one i was thinking of since you mentioned uh, your fields crossing there is an underwater skeleton when ray falls into the dark side cave that leads to the mirror section you see her splashing around in the water and there's some bones at the bottom of the scene that maybe some sort of dark side sea monster no way i'm gonna have to go back and look for that now yeah there's I lots mean- of bones out there in these movies yeah so the obvious ones are uh the crate dragon in a new hope that was definitely a scene for me as a kid where I was like, wait, don't just pan by. I want to know more about that. Star Wars is littered with dinosaurs. And a lot of them are kind of design inspirations that are used for dinosaurs. You can think of during the pod race, um, there's that one uh, pod racer who has kind of the spikes on his head. Looks like a triceratops sort of animal that got squished. And um, it, it, they're nosaurians. And the, in the, the Dark Times comic, uh, they kind of went full, a whole dinosaur hog on them, and they looked a very dinosaurish. ish um, There's other ones. I think the Yavithra um, from Legends Ooh, wow. is a um, like kind of a, a raptor type animal. But that there is a are deep cut. I, I, you, I can go deep. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have read every Legends book that there is. In Star Wars itself, the original Star Wars, there are two dinosaurs in them and these are probably the most dinosaur of the dinosaurs that we'll get and i'm gonna go with the i'm gonna before we get to the crate dragon because this is that is the most dinosaur of the dinosaurs that we're gonna get we're gonna go to the ronto and do you guys know the ronto yeah i was playing with my ronto it's on my dining room table right now do you know what the ronto is no, the Ronto, really. the what came out before the special editions because the Ronto was added in the special editions of A New Hope. Before that, what did ILM work on? Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. The Ronto is the Brachiosaurus. Like it is the model of the Brachiosaurus, just kind of 
shrunk down and mm-hmm. I think the, the, the skin texture was a little changed, but the model is the Brachiosaurus model. And, and then they added some ears, those giant ear flappy things. Yeah. So they, like, they, they modified it slightly, but really it is the Brachiosaurus. And so that, that's your one dinosaur. That's kind of a dinosaur, but not really. The so is actual- the Ronto, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm clear and that our listeners are clear. The Ronto is in the scene where they're going into Moss Eisley, some Jawa is like swinging from its reins or something yeah, like that. So it kind of rears, okay. it's a giant four-legged animal. Brachiosaurus is, you think of like a Brontosaurus. Um, it's kind of, they're similar, except Brachiosaurus's heads are usually more vertical. Um, it mm-hmm. kind of rears up on its hind legs. The same thing that you see in Jurassic Park, actually, when they have a herd of Brachiosaurus, it rears up on its back legs to get some uh, branches at the top of the tree. Oh, that's very cool. So, but now my favorite one is the crate dragon. And it's my favorite one. I even, uh, I've, if you know the author, Daniel Jose Older, um, I just interviewed him on my podcast and we were talking about this. He's a, a big dinosaur guy. He, he wrote a couple of books with dinosaurs. And I told him about this, is that there is an actual dinosaur in Star Wars. And that is the neck bones of the crate dragon. Oh, they gosh. are a cast of a Diplodocus. So this is kind of like, there's never been anything as far as I'm aware, full, firmly nailing this down as positive proof, but there are um, a couple of uh, other paleontologists online who have also looked into this. And there's a um, website by uh, a person I know called Sauropod Vertebrate Picture of the Week or SVPAL. And the, the uh, paleontologist on here, Mike Weddle, he is a sauropod or a, the, the, like the Brachiosaurus, um, he studied, he studies them and he looked at the vertebrae from the movie and he was looking at them closely and he says they really look like Diplodocus vertebrae. And you kind of can backtrack where these came from. And there was another Disney movie that came out not too long before Star Wars in 1975 called One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing. In we found which, it. <laughs> it's in Tatooine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it, that's where this dinosaur came from. This skeleton um, had a <laughs> terrible dinosaur. The skull is really messed up, but they had the, the vertebrae. And so the, 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 they're pretty sure that the dinosaur from this movie from 1975 is the same one that is in a new hope is that they just laid out these vertebrae in the, in the desert, they added a new skull to it. Um, and so the, the actual dinosaur that it came from is a Diplodocus known as Dippy um, from the Carnegie museum of natural history. What they did is they cast to the bones. Um, this, okay. this Diplodocus back in the seventies had a lot of casts made of it, basically made copies of the bones. Um, most of what you see in museums are copies of bones, casts of bones. You rarely see actual bones. And the reason for that is one, these bones are incredibly heavy. Uh, a lot of the larger dinosaur bones you could not pick up um, with a team of people. Like, like they are t- several puns in weight um smaller bones also scientists need to be able to study them and they need to be kept in good preservation and you can't really do that if they're on display but you can sometimes so um you could really easily tell in a museum if the dinosaur is real or the bones are real or not or the the fossils are real uh, um by the fact that if you look at the bones if the little metal rods are going through the bones it's not real not real. Fair enough. And like, if you can see the metal framing and it's kind of holding the bones, then it's more than likely probably real. And so the, a lot of casts were made of Dippy. And this was one of those casts that probably made its way eventually to the, um, that first Disney movie, then made it way to Star Wars, at which point it was left in the desert. Was it really? And they just left it there. They just left it there. And uh, apparently when they went back for Attack of the Clones, people were still finding it. It was still there. Because it probably got buried pretty quickly, right? I always hear that dunes move over the matter of like a couple of weeks. Yeah, depending on how fast the winds are, dunes can move really quickly. 
Wow, that's wild. I'm curious to know what you thought of the crate dragon then in the Mandalorian. Um, what I'm showing here now is uh, the crate dragon from the wildlife field guide that Tara Whitlatch um, put together in the nineties. Um, and, okay. and it was always to me, what was true about everything. Um, Cause she had, uh, you know, Lucas films go ahead to, to make this. And so I always thought of it as something, you know, that looks like this, where it's got legs and a pretty, pretty small mouth and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it even showed in here it dragging off and, and eating a Sarlacc. Um, and then I'm assuming you've watched the Mandalorian and have maybe some mm -hmm. thoughts about the depiction of the Kray dragon in that versus those bones we saw um, in a new hope. So Kray dragon in um, star Wars has been all over the place. Uh, most of the crate dragon representations have actually made it look kind of like, um, like a monitor lizard, like a giant monitor lizard, which doesn't really line up with the skeleton that we see in a new hope. And they, like, usually the skulls are absolutely huge. Again, doesn't line up with what we see in the new hope. Um, but that's kind of what they went with. And this is like, that's what they eventually did. And um, for most of like the books and comics, that's kind of kind of what the, what they it was used. Uh, Dave Filoni and John Favreau completely erased anything that that was done before and did their own thing one hundred percent. And I actually really like it because it does match more of the what the fossil is in the in the sand because you have a head a very small head in relation to the size of the neck. And you assume the one in the sand is a baby um, based on the fact that this thing is absolutely ginormous. And what I heard is that um, I, I don't know for real uh, whatever they decided, but that what we see in the movie is just the head and the neck. It does actually have a body with legs. Um, they're just, they're just deep over inside. the dune. All right, Jim, let's switch over more to the geology side. But quickly, what's the difference between geology and paleontology? Uh, geology is the study of basically the earth. Um, rocks uh, are the most often defined um, geological things that are studied, but really geologists will study anything about the earth. Everything that's tied to the earth are very intricately linked. Um, myself, I would consider myself a sedimentologist, which basically studies sedimentary rocks, how sediments move through the earth, how they get deposited, um, like sand, sand dunes, and that sort of thing. And uh, th those are your overall what geology kind of encompasses. Paleontology itself is the study of ancient life. And so anything to do with ancient life through the past would be considered part of paleontology. Dinosaurs are really only one instance of life within our past. There's um, billions of different species of life that uh, have been on the, the planet. And so paleontologists will study insects, bacteria. Um, like I said, I study trace fossils, which of animals that um, what I studied, we don't even know the animals that made these traces that I've, I've studied. I was more interested in the patterns that they had made and why they had made them. Um, and then like I had mentioned archeology span and that I'm not an archeologist, archeologists basically study human history. And that's what we get Indiana Jones studying all those human artifacts and stuff that the uh, paleontologists and archeologists do not study the same thing. Archeologists is more about the, like I said, human history and the things that humans had created. And then, um, anthropology is the study of ancient humans and kind of where we came from and anthropology and paleontology kind of overlap depending on how far back you go in human history. So Jim, recently I went to Death Valley to visit a lot of the Star Wars filming sites there. They filmed uh, quite a few scenes from A New Hope uh, about Tatooine. Uh, can you tell us what the geology of Death Valley is like and how that connects to what the geology of Tatooine must be like? So when you're talking about Tatooine, you're basically talking about a desert. Like it, 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 there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It is a desert. And a desert has a very specific definition within geology. And so a desert is any place that has received less than 10 inches of rain in a year. Where I live in Utah, uh, I live just outside of Salt Lake City, and I live, I don't live in a desert, but I live really close to it. We live, we get about 12 inches of rain a year. 
And so it's uh, not technically a desert, but just to the west of us is considered the, um, the high desert. And so any place on earth that gets less than 10 inches of year, uh, rain a year is considered a desert. And the largest desert on earth, do you know where that is? I'm going to assume the Sahara Desert. It is not. It is the... the um, oh, Antarctica. The Antarctic Desert. Yes. It is, I should have uh, known that one. Because Antarctica is one of the driest places on earth. The thing is, is when it snows, it just doesn't go anywhere. So it's like it, um, it, it basically is a desert by definition, but that's not the type of desert we see here. This is um, what we considered a hot desert, whereas Antarctica is a cold desert. And so when you're looking at deserts, deserts, uh, there's five different types of deserts depending on how they form. The most famous desert, like you said, um, is the Sahara on Earth. And most of the deserts that we have on Earth are formed by wind patterns. When, when air currents go up, they get colder. And when they get colder, they, can, they kind of they drop all the moisture that they're carrying. And so you get um, what's called a rain shadow effect where like say air currents are moving across a mountain range. They'll go up over the mountain range where you get one side, you get a um, like a rainforest or you get a lot of rain on one side of the mountains. As you go past the mountains, the air currents go down. So like As, the Himalayas, you know, are a rain shadow or they, they form a rain shadow. And so on the North side, the Tibetan plateau is, is a desert where on the South side, that's where all the rain gets dropped in India and Nepal. Yes, and so when the, rain, when the air comes down, the air heats up and it expands. As it expands, it can hold more water. When it can hold more water, there's less water in the air then because the air is being able to hold more water as opposed to when it's going up, it is getting compacted and it is basically being able to hold less water and that's why you get all the water kind of drops out of the air. So when it holds more water, you're drying out the air or you're drying out the land surface, making it very dry. And so you have these um, rain shadows that they're called on the backs of mountains. And a lot it happens a lot. It, the, uh, most of the West Coast of the United States is this rain shadow effect because in the United States, the winds move from the West Coast towards the East Coast the, along the jet stream path. And so as it goes over the mountains, you get a lot of rain in California, and then you get this very, very dry area to the east of those mountains in an area that you know, James, Death Valley. Mm -hmm. Really are the reason that our planet gets these really, really dry areas. Tatooine, on the other hand, probably is not that way because you have the whole planet as one big dust ball. So they probably don't have your same air patterns, but they clearly do have air patterns because they have sand dunes and sand dunes are created by wind currents uh, where you have these sand areas is a, a term called an erg uh erg is one of my favorite geology terms um not a blurg but an erg <laughs> an erg it is a, a erg, definition of an erg is a sand sea and so uh the sahara would be considered an erg and the largest erg that we've had on earth um, was actually in North America. Um, there's a, a, a rock called the Navajo sandstone uh, back from the Jurassic age. And it covered an area um, about 800,000 square kilometers uh, of desert um, that it's estimated that it covered, which is much, much larger than the, the Sahara. And the Sahara actually isn't the largest erg on earth today anyway. Um, it's the Arabian desert. So where did the water go on Tatooine? Um, we, we, we see proof that there was water there. We see these, uh, you know, arroyos that look like they're flash floods that came down them. Mm -hmm. Um, we see, uh, other things that again, look like they were shaped more by water than by, by wind. My guess is that it's just in another place that we haven't seen on the planet, probably towards the poles. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're like, I, I love that Star Wars is these all encompassing planets, but we never really see much of them. Like the forest moon of Endor is the forest moon, but how much of it we've we really seen. Right. It's like, it's like the yeah. forest moon of Endor is the size of the Redwoods um, National Park. <laughs> Where do you think you're going? 
Well, I'm not going that way. It's much too rocky. And then what about these rock formations? Because there's definitely in a lot of the sequences of Tatooine, you know, there are the dunes, but there's also, you know, what James was talking about in terms of like the, the valleys and uh, almost like crevasses or something like that in some of these really big rock formations. So the rocks formed, the rocks basically formed from the sand. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the rocks that we see are sandstone, which, um, form from the sand and also actually give us the sand. It's kind of a cycle. Um, as the rocks break down, the sand comes back out, but it is, they are formed by water. You have um, a lot of these sand dunes, especially during these larger erg periods. I did find the name of the largest erg on earth today. Is the- You mean Al-Rub Al-Hali, the empty quarter? But is that, that's a, something you've studied in relationship to Star Wars 2, James? That's how you knew about it? Uh, no, just uh, looking at old globes. Uh, okay, <laughs> nerds, I love it. What happens is that these large sand seas, when um, sand actually, the dunes move, as we talked about. Wind will blow the dunes. Um, basically, it will blow the sand up one side of the dune, and it will fall down the other side. And it will make these little parallel rows of sand on the backside of the dune. And as the wind blows, it'll continually move the sand across these lines. Um, and these these rows are called cross bedding that you can actually see in a lot of these um, sandstone rocks. If you ever see it, kind of look, they look like they have like lines going across them. Um, these are the cross beddings from the dunes, and so that's how you know that those were once ancient dunes. But what happens is that the those sand dunes will get frozen in time. Basically, if they're, the water level kind of rises up, it'll freeze those dunes and um, minerals within the water will lock those sand grains in place, uh, be it calcite or um, the, the quartz from the, the sand. Most sand is uh, a mineral called quartz. It's a very hard mineral, um, basically rounded to a little round ball. Almost all sand that we know of today is, is, is quartz. So, so quartz is the reason that sand is coarse and rough and irritating and gets everywhere. Uh, depending on what sand dune you're on, but uh, on Tatooine, <laughs> yes, I would, I would say yes. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. The, the majority of these rocks that we're seeing is likely the sand, sandstone. Sandstone, depending on what it's solidified by, can be a very, very hard rock. Um, like I said, quartz is your sand grains, but it also dissolves slightly in water. And so when you dissolve quartz, you get silica. And then when that silica re, um, can get rehardened into these the cement of these rocks, you're dealing with sandstone that will basically um, bounce a rock hammer back at your face. Not that I am well aware of that has never happened to me. <laughs> I, I think I saw some of these very cement-like uh, bits of sandstone when I was in Death Valley recently uh, going, going up Golden Canyon. There were several spots where I swear it looked like somebody had put concrete pavement and you know it served as a cap for holding down what was underneath it because it was just really hard and really flat. And you think that's somebody that's where you get a lot of it. times. Yeah. That's where you get a lot of times with these um, mesas, the, um, the flat top hills, mm-hmm. the top of your mesa is going to be a very, very hard rock. Um, whether it be a sandstone or limestone is an, another type of rock that uh, um, is from basically animal life that uh, like clams and stuff that um, made their own shells. But when they die, they make these limestone blocks that very, very hard. And so when you have these mesas, that very, very hard rock is on top, very difficult to erode uh, everything underneath it. Not so hard usually. And so that gets worn away really quickly. But with the top cap rock there, it'll keep um, the erosion to a minimum, especially out in the West of the U- United States, as I'm sure you've seen, James, is that, and uh, let's see, you're also out West, mm-hmm. um, is that we have a lot of desert because we don't get a lot of water, again, being in that uh, rain shadow. Um, there's also another type of desert called the continental desert, where it just means you're really far away from water. And so that's kind of where the Western U S is kind of a mix of a lot of different types of deserts. And so since we don't get much water, we don't get a much erosion and you get these extreme landforms, the very sharp uh, hills um, and these very wide valleys 
And that's a lot of what you see in um, Tatooine as well as these extreme landforms, just because like when you have a lot of water, you have a lot of plant growth, you have a lot of erosion, you have a lot of smoothing out of the landscape and you don't get that in deserts. So how do we get some of those mountainous rocky areas that, that do you think there's plate tectonics going on on Tatooine? Um, there would have to be. Uh, basically, you need plate tectonics to be pushing up the mountains and without the water, I would be interested to see how it would work um, because uh, on our pl- planet, our, our planet is broken up into a series of plates where you have at the bottom of the oceans, you have the mantle, which is the uh, kind of the, uh, the cream filled center of the earth. Uh, coming up as new rock at the base of the oceans. And it's very, very dense rock. And so since it's so dense, it sits uh, deeply within our kind of liquidy mantle. And so that dense uh, oceanic crust is now sitting a lot lower. All the water sits on top of it. And eventually that dense oceanic crust will kind of get pushed along by that um, as it comes up, like kind of a volcano, get pushed along towards our continents where it hits the continents, our continents are a lot lighter, a lot fluffier. They kind of sit up a lot higher. They aren't as dense. So that dense oceanic rock will go down below the fluffier continental rocks. And it'll actually push those continental rocks up higher. Right. Again, so a subduction zone that that you know causes the the mountains to be pushed upwards and maybe also has some volcanic hot spots that else help build a little exactly. bit. Exactly. And so all of our mountains on our planet are basically formed from these interactions where the subduction zones um, doesn't even have to be a subduction zone, any convergent boundary where you have two plates colliding against each other, which what you have in the Himalayas, you have two plates colliding against each other, making these massive mountains. Um, Even the Adirondacks on the, the East coast of the United States, they are um, much, much subdued just because they're much, much older. You're looking at mountain ranges that are 500 million years old compared to the Rockies, which are still forming today. One, one question I still have about Tatooine is I feel like in the Phantom Menace during the pod race scenes, they go through some caverns and I swear there's some stalactites or stalagmites in there. And so that would indicate the presence of, of some water going through there at, at some point in time. And like, again, you know, how, did the water table just recede? So we have these open uh, caverns or, you know, I'm just curious about uh, how, how they got there. When you look at caves, caves themselves, like uh, we're talking about limestone. Limestone is a very, very hard rock, but it also dissolves really, really easily if there's water around. And so all of our caves on earth are formed out of limestone, a mineral called calcium carbonate or calcite. It, um, Like if there's any rainfall, rain picks up acidity in the soil really easily. And so rain is naturally acidic when it hits the groundwater. It's this limestone. It dissolves away really quickly. It's actually one of the ways that geologists can tell if we have limestone is that we usually just dump acid on it. And if it if when we dump acid on it, it actually bubbles up really well. So that's unfreezing things in carbonite. Oh, Um, I like that. Carbonate, calcium carbonate. Excuse me. Yes, yes. Uh, and I was just thinking of how much I love that some of science is still that sort of thing. I don't know. What is it? Let's pour some acid on it. That'll tell That's us. That's literally it. Ooh, you chemistry. follow any geologist on Twitter. There's tons of them that's like, can I lick this rock? Because we lick <laughs> everything. Um, and it's, hey, it's I, I licked some some rocks in, in Death Valley when we're out on the salt pan. My Okay, I think you guys are going to have to explain this to me. What? <laughs> the taste. We just talked about halite. Halite, use a salt. How do you tell it's a salt? You can't feel a salt in your fingers. You taste a salt. And so there's a lot of rocks. Your, um, your teeth and your tongue are tremendously sensitive. And you can actually tell grain sizes in, say, like shale versus a slightly larger grain called siltstone by rubbing it on your teeth. Shale is a clay. It'll feel smooth on your teeth. We jail just call it like a Hershey bar. Whereas a siltstone will feel gritty, like, a, like you're rubbing sandpaper on your teeth. But like just looking at it, you can't tell the difference. 
Wow. It's amazing. And I so, love this. Yeah, um, and so basically what happens with limestone is that water will get into the caves, kind of like a river system. You think in the United States, our largest caves, and actually I think the largest caves in the world are mammoth caves. Mammoth caves are actually a series of levels where the top level is like some of the largest caves. Um, and then you can actually go down deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think off the top of my head, there's about five levels in Mammoth Caves where that deepest level has the river system in it. So your top level is completely dry. There's no rivers in there. And what happens to get your stalactites and your stalagmites is that water kind of will drip through the upper layers. It'll pick up that limestone, the, the calcium in the rocks, and then it'll um, as it dissolves away, it'll kind of work its way down and carry that away with it. But when you hit like these open caverns that got dissolved away, it'll start to drip down from the, the, the ceiling. And as it drips, it'll leave behind a little bit of calcium. That'll be your stalactite starting to form on the ceiling. And then it splashes on the ground. It'll be your stalagmite um, that might read the ceiling that the slag tight is tight on the ceiling i could um, never keep that straight oh i, I <laughs> always learned it just a stalac slack tights are like a pair of tights hanging down so that might work for me because the the whole might touch the ceiling and is never stuck so i like it <laughs> so um so you have the calcium carbonate dripping down from the ceiling the the, the being deposited on the ground you get your two uh, slack tight meeting your slack might forming your column eventually and kind of that's what you're seeing when you go through this uh, the racing through the cave and then the water can keep going down into the ground eventually if the water is completely gone your cave's still there like the cave we have evidence of caves that have been around for like millions of years that there is no water reference or even like with mammoth cave system, your river is so far deep into the ground that most people who visit mammoth caves will never see the river hmm. uh, unless they're seeing it on the outside. Um, that's a, when I visited, I saw the, uh, the outer uh, exits of the river, but I never saw it in the cave. Oh, that sounds really cool. I'll have to visit that. And so that's what we, a lot of your water could be is just, deeper in the earth uh, here as well. Hmm. Right. Maybe your plate tectonics lifted the planet up so high. You also have two suns. Like it's going to be hot. <laughs> Fair enough. You yeah. probably just have a lot of evaporation dealing in, in the atmosphere, just keeping that hot. This could have been a 45 second episode podcast. If we thought of that 45 minutes ago, <laughs> I love it. Well, there's two suns. It's hot. There's two yeah. suns. It's hot. <laughs> one, one final thought I had about something that might change uh, Tatooine's geology in a way that we don't see on earth perhaps is crate dragons and their ability to burrow through rock and sand. How, how, what, what do you think that does to the planetary geology? So that really interested me because I, when it, we see it in the Mandalorian, we see them kind of burrowing through the, the, the ground and then it just literally pops up through solid rock. And that threw me through a loop because most animals you don't see burrow straight through solid rock. There's <laughs> Johnny. <Yeah. laughs> um, and so, well, you perhaps you have this apex predator on the planet. You're probably dealing with something that can alter your landscape significantly with very few individuals based on the size of it. Um, or they just killed the only one on the planet, and um, you're you're. Let's not think about have... that. <laughs> it <makes me laughs> so sad. It, it, it actually formed by um, self replication. So this is the same animal that has only there's only ever been one, and it just sheds its bones periodically. Yeah. Um, and so maybe your major erosional force is wind and the great dragon. Yeah, I like that idea. So it's going to be a really weird next hundred years while the next biggest crate dragon gets big enough to yep, and drive down like, Main Street, Mos yeah. Pelgo. So Jim, can you share a little bit about your educational background with us? You can go through paleontology in one of two ways. You can go the biology route or you can go the geology route. And I know paleontologists on both sides of that fence and they are, you're studying two different aspects of the same thing. And so, like I said, I'm a sedimentologist that studies the sediment in the field and you study um, the rocks that the animals are living in. And um, basically to become a paleontologist or a geologist, you go to school, you learn 
all the basics of geology. There is a ton out there that you can learn and you kind of pick your field that you like the best as you you kind of going through. Very cool. So you mentioned that you host a couple of podcasts. Can you tell us a little bit more about those and where else we can find you online? Sure. Uh, so in Star Wars wise, I have two podcasts that I am um, co-host. Uh, one is the podcast that I help start called Talking Tauntauns. And um, we basically are a general uh, news, interviews, reviews, pretty much anything that crosses our path. Um, and that's through uh, uh, AIPTcomics.com that I had mentioned before that I write for. Um, so you can find us pretty much anywhere. Uh, Talking Tauntauns without the G. Uh, the other podcast that I co-host is called Star Wars Beyond the Films. I had taken over for one of the previous uh, um, co-hosts that had left, and we do book reviews and comic reviews and a lot of story reviews mainly. As for my writings, I have several websites that I write, um, mostly on my own. You can find everything on my main website called dinogym.com. Um, I also do a website called drunkongeology.com. And it, it, it delves into those geology. Um, when you go into the liquor store and you see a beer or a wine or something else with a geology themed name, I kind of break down what does that name mean? Where does it come from? How does it relate to this wine? Other things I write, uh, the geology page. Um, and that's, uh, um, that's my main blog website that I write on. Uh, jazzinator.blogspot.com and that's actually where you can find me on Twitter is jazzinator um, with one Z. Can you spell that real quick? J-A-Z-I-N-A-T-O-R and I'm on Instagram as Dino Jim. So if you just look up Dino Jim or Jazzinator, I'm usually one of those two unless somebody stole them. Thanks, Jim, so much for answering our ridiculous questions about how geology and paleontology (laughs) refer to Star Wars. I am happy to talk science. And I just wanted to you know, say thanks to, to Dr. Jim here for answering uh, tons of questions about Tatooine and you know, from all different angles. So thank you once again. And thanks to our listeners. And thanks so much, Jim, for having us on Talking Tauntauns. You can find us in episode 62 of that great podcast. And if you, our listeners, have questions for Dr. Jim or about this episode, email us or get in touch with us on social media, and we will bother him again later for some answers. It's no bother. (laughs) Well, thanks. That wraps up our first episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank our guest, Jim Lehane, and we want to thank all of you for listening. We are part of the Skywalking Network, where you can also find a variety of other great shows like Talking Apes, Classic Marvel Star Wars Comics, the Max EFX Podcast, The Neverland Clubhouse, Resilient Squadron, Totally Tell Me Everything, and the flagship show, Skywalking Through Neverland. You can find all of these shows at skywalkingnetwork.com. Got an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies or know an expert in their field that we should interview? Let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or at Star Wars Ologies, that's Star Wars, O-L-O-G-I-E-S at gmail.com. And check out our YouTube channel for screenshots from the movies that we mentioned and pictures of Jim in the field. No topic is off limits, even the taxation of trade routes in outlying systems. See you next time on Star Wars Ologies when we discuss the ecology of Dagobah. Because we love Tatooine. Oh, we love it. Oh, we love it here at Tatooine.